Doctors are thinking they might have to do some sort of a surgery tomorrow, and he's had several already. So we're really praying he does not have to have it, so he can come home soon. Yes, we will pray for that as well. Thank you. So we've been praying for him every week. I know you have. Thank you so much. I was told I've been not here a couple weeks for different things. So yeah, thanks. And the other one had tonsils. He's doing great. Thank you so much. Yeah, he's doing wonderful. All right. Any other praise reports or prayer requests? Okay. Um, let's get started then. Okay, dear Lord, we praise you and thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, uh, for being with us, for sending your spirit, God, and for hearing our prayers before we even speak to them, Lord. We praise you that Joey is, is recovering well. We pray, God, that um, you continue to give the doctors wisdom and that they will uh, see if anything needs to be done. And, and you know, we also pray that nothing further needs to be done, that, yes. that what he's, has been performed on him will be the last surgery that he's needed and he'll continue to heal and get better. Yes. Lord. Lord, we also know that there's, there's a number of likely unspoken prayer requests and you, and you know them without us even speaking them out, Lord, and we pray that you would, you would meet those needs and that you would provide answers and uh, peace in, in every situation, Lord, we pray. Thank you. Amen. 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 Okay. So today we're going to look at uh, another narrative, but a, a different one. So last, last week we looked more, more on, the, on the Old Testament narratives, a little bit on the, on the New Testament, but... Um, but this is a, a kind of a specific narrative in Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, right? Um, so I, I wrote down a few things like we, we talked about before. How do we how do we first approach something in this context about about Acts specifically, and and as we go through and studying it? So you know, the writer. Who does everybody know who the author of Acts is? Luke. Luke, Luke, and so he, it was a lot of times it's considered a, a continuation of the gospel, the second letter, so his first letter uh, was written to Theophilus, this one was also written to Theophilus um, as, a, as a documentation of what happened after, after Christ, um, so you know, when, when is, the, is the occurrence happening, what's, what's the time frame of, of these writings. First century. First century, right. And, and they happen specifically, exactly they pick up from when Christ is, after Christ is resurrected, and through all the way until Paul is in Rome. So there's a lot of things that are happening here in this specific time frame of this document. And, and Luke appears by his writing to be um, involved in a lot of those 
areas, right? And so sometimes it, it looks like he's, he's writing from a historical point of view, but other times he, he uses the words we. He says, he says we were here, or um, you know, when they, when they were thrown from, from, the, from the boat, like we, we went to the island. So there's a lot of things that, that, he's, that gives us indication that he was, am I speaking loud enough? Okay. That, that he, was, um, he was there in actually documenting things firsthand. Um, and what we, we see um, documented, Anybody, any other things in Acts that, that you'd like to point out or, or consider that is, is talked about in, in Acts, specifically any major happenings? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's <laughs> huge. The one. main thing. Yes, yes. And, and the spread of the gospel, right. right? Because of that. And the persecution of, of the Jewish believers that, that also happened in, in Jerusalem. And then, and then why? Why he wrote Acts. We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about why, um, but specifically, I mean, he, he definitely wrote it to Theophilus, he definitely um, documented the Acts of the Holy Spirit and the Acts of the Apostles, and so, and then where? What's interesting about, about Acts, it starts in Jerusalem, and it, um, it, it talks about kind of the north and western progression, of, of the, um, of the gospel, you know, which is what he was experiencing. There was, there's, also evidence that, it, it went east, it went south, right? Because we know that that Africa was saved, and the, and the discussion with, with the Ethiopian who was saved, and that it went there. Um, but that's not very well documented in Acts. Um, in, in a lot of places, it's not well documented in the Bible, but it happened. We know that it happened. Um, but that's, those are the primary uh, reasons of, of, of why I put here just the map just to show that, they, that there was a lot of, a lot of um, considering their mode of transportation, a lot of ground cover in order to move, to move, the, um, move the, the, the gospel. Okay, uh, when you read Acts, which, do you read it differently from Old Testament narratives? Do you yeah. do you does it hit differently than you know like like as you're reading it, do you say, okay, this is you pay more attention to Acts than Old Testament narrative? Yeah. 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 Why? Just because it's the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people do. A lot of people do. They they cover it in the book, but a lot of times people will. We'll spend a little bit more, um, put a little bit. I uh, think the New Testament narratives, the the New Testament stories, they'll they'll look at and and putting the application of those more into into life than Old Testament. And so that's a lot of times when people will read specifically Acts versus like like Daniel or or um, or in, in Genesis about Joseph. It's more relatable, and it's also more specific about okay, this is this is how the church started. This is and, and take more of it like okay, this is maybe how I I should um, I should relate, or it's more relatable. So that's there is some you know the authors of, of this book definitely as well say that that most people read it a little differently, take it a little differently than some of the Old Testament stuff. And, and do, do we, do we, does it, does it set precedent for our own lives and, and for the church? Um, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. Right? There's definitely some things that are spoken of and specifically instructed, uh, which we'll talk about, um, that, that we do today. Um, how how are they, they're specifically handled, maybe a little differently, but, but it's definitely something that, that is, um, is done 
uh, today. What are several, there's several reasons why someone might want to study eggs. Is there, what, what types of reasons would those be? It's, it's the beginning of the church. The beginning of the church, yeah. I think it's the beginning of the dependence on the Holy Spirit. Yep. It's the starts of the, the creeds of the church also. Mm -hmm. okay. I, think, I think a lot of people, I agree with all those, and I, and I definitely think also, you know, like you were talking about the dependence of the Holy Spirit, I think a lot of people go back um, to look for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, when, they, when they're searching for that, they will spend some time in Acts as well. Um, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of um, things that the, the established in the church that they come out of Acts. And so I think it's, it's important to continue to study it and, and to look at it. Um, the, you can see that, that Luke does it in a way when he's writing his narrative, he, he does it in a way that is, is to capture the attention of, of the reader or the listener. A lot of times we talked about last week how um, the, the scrolls were listened to uh, more than, than read uh, because of, of people didn't have access to them or didn't know how to read. Um, so they're definitely written in a way that, that grab attention. Um, and, he, and he definitely takes the look at taking the transition from the ministry of Jesus in the gospel to the ministry and revealing of the Holy Spirit um, and following that ministry. Some things to look at as, as you read Acts and study it. You know, why did Luke specifically shape a story the way he did, right? So is there, is there something more there that, that he's trying to tell us, or, or is it specifically uh, the way that he wrote it? Is that, is that, is that um, a reason that he did in a certain way? Um, if there's reported themes and wordings, those are things that he wants to emphasize. So, um, like, uh, for example, when, uh, when Peter tells the story of, of reading, or, or seeing the vision, right? He saw the vision of, of the blanket being lowered down and um, three times and God said, you know, go ahead and eat, right? And he, he, at first he's like, no, I don't eat things that's not kosher, right? And that was, and, and the message was to really to go and, and the Gentiles should be brought into the fold. And, and that, but as well, when he, he, he retold the story as a second time when, when, of his vision when he talked to Cornelius. And so this is, is something that is specifically there twice because it's a retelling to say this is emphasize the meaning of, of what you're reading or what you're listening to so you, it's, it's very clear that this is important. And then um, natural divisions of the book. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, so Acts is history, you know, the, the history portion of, of Acts uh, definitely aligns with other, other scripture, right? You can definitely see the influence of the Roman culture. You can see that um, the rulers at that time aligned, so there's a lot of factual data that shows up from the history portion of it and the history of the church that is, is very interesting to believers, right? And it's things that are important to us. Um, Sometimes there's different ways you can divide Acts um, and, and how, it, how it's look, looked at. Um, there's, some people look at it as a two-part division. At first, it looks at, at Peter as the lead and taking the lead and the main character through the Holy Spirit. And then in the second part, it's Paul. He's, he's taking the lead in, um, of the discussion, uh, as well as geographically that the expansion to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uh, and the rest of the world, those different chapters uh, focus on those. And then the gospel spread. Um, what, what, what I saw in, in my Bible, in the, in the introduction from the study Bible, as well as in, in this book, a lot, they, they kind of were proponents of that it, it doesn't naturally fall into chapter divisions, but there's sections in the chapters that make a division. So I, I don't know necessarily how they set up the chapters when they did it, but there's certain divisions that happen kind of mid-chapter. So for example, um, like in the first, after 
the first section, it says, and the gospel spread rapidly. And then it immediately goes into uh, another portion of the story. Or, or it goes, there's discussions about it, and, and the disciples increase rapidly, based ending one story and starting into another story. And so there's, there's about six of those happening throughout the, the book that, that it goes from, okay, this is how we got to this situation. The result was the, the, the rapid spread of the gospel. And, and then it moves into another story and, and expansion area. And, um, and basically they go through specifically the early church, uh, the expansion uh, to Jewish people the introduction of Saul and the martyrdom of, of Stephen, and then the expansion to include the Gentiles where Peter visited, we just talked about the vision and the visit to Cornelius, as well as further to the Gentiles as Paul heads out to other points and, and eventually into Rome, which is I think is significant as, as um, you know, the, the, the Jewish people put put Christ on trial, and um, and then the Romans put, put Paul on trial, and, and eventually both become, if you want to call Rome kind of the, for a long time, the head of Christianity as, as a Catholic church um, is, is an interesting dynamic that happened there. Um, okay. Any comments, questions up at this point of the discussion? So the telling of the story of the movement of the gospel orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, this is his main purpose with writing. That's why he wanted to, to explain this, is like you mentioned, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but then also the empowerment of that, which is pretty amazing because if you consider how forcefully all the areas that the gospel was going, how they were specifically going after trying to stop the movement of the gospel, and the only way it could happen is is by some, pe some is by people being so committed because of their experience, which happened by the Holy Spirit. Right? There's no other way that I think this could have survived the, the persecution and, and the, the strong attacks from from Jerusalem, as well as as the other reasons where where Paul was, um, where they they continue to sometimes accept, but also have to fight the culture there. And I think that's that's uh, really. Um, the main story here as well as um, he, there's things that he doesn't go into as he's telling the stories, the narratives. He doesn't go into a lot of biography of the characters. He does Paul, but but not a lot of others. Um, he does not go into church organization specifically. There's a lot that happens in the start of the church, but it doesn't say, okay, you should have deacons, you should have elders, you should have a board meeting every month, or you should have any of that stuff is, is not there, right? Um, and he didn't uh, follow other paths of the church to show the complete history of the church. He just followed what he specifically was um, was doing. And there's no standardization of, of the Christian experience. So, so specifically, like um, water baptism and and the Holy Spirit, there's some, there's discussions of things that happen, but as far as like, okay, when you get um, water baptized, you have to be fully emerged. This is not specifically there, right? It's a, we, as an organization, as a, as a Christian church, practice that. There's also um, churches that practice, you know, baptism of, of infants. That's not something we practice, but there's nothing that says that it should not be done either. Right, um, so there's there's some things that are implied, but some things that are are not implied. So that you could tell. So from that point of view, the the specific um, details there are um, are left out and left up to us to to organize ourselves. And so that's I think part of of being an early um, organization, and that, that a lot of times things and rules and, and practices come throughout the organization developing, um, so those are not specifically um, there. Okay, but maybe we can dig into a little bit of it 
and, and take a look at, at what we're seeing here uh, firsthand in Acts. So let's, the first section I want to see if we can read is Acts 6, 1 through 7. Let's see if we can read that. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, <clears throat> a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Partimus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Good. Okay. And so I think, you know, this is this shows specifically, um, you know, what what uh, what was happening and, and, and how the church was growing, and and the growth there. I think um, it, it, it's good. What um, was was there a specific uh, point of, of this? this narrative here that we wanted to, to pull out of it. Well, I've always seen that, that is an organization of the church yes. because they have defined areas now. And I, I'm absolutely right, as the other books of the, of the Gospel, the New Testament, go on to expand each and every one of them, the sprout is happening in this church. Mm -hmm. The closer we get to that moment of the Holy Spirit, Yep. There is some there is some organization for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Yeah. But you, you you're right, it's not Luke's main focus at all. Mm -hmm. And and there's some there's some things that he doesn't yeah. It, it, it's a start of an organization. Um and and but it but as far as like explicitly saying so this is the way we need to be organized. So if we looked at the book of Acts as a book written under the inspiration of, of God, of course, yeah. but that it is a narrative being written to somebody. I am writing a history book of what's going on, and let me tell you about this, and let me tell you about that, knowingly or unknowingly, that all the world would have an opportunity to read the book of Acts. Right. We, we have been put in that position of Theopolis, I think it's it? Yes. Yes. So we, we're we benefiting from that and receiving that as a cornerstone. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And so how does, how does this fit into the overall story here, right? It shows, like I think very well, like you said, it, it shows starting organization. It, it shows um, the spread. Um, I think what's interesting here, they also prayed and, and, and identified um, people to, to go into leadership. What was in at the beginning, uh, they they cast lots as someone to, to replace Judas. I think this maybe is a better route to go. Um, so that's that's something that that also changed throughout as they became more wise as an organization. Um, all right, let's take a look at Acts eight one through twenty five. Is there someone who would like to read this? And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. 
Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was a great joy in that city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was somewhat great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere. Astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in his ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. That's dramatic. Yes. <laughs> so it... it yeah, the point of this, what's the, the point specifically of this this narrative and how does it fit into the story? I mean, I got from it that sometimes people in the church, they say and look and do all the right things, but their hearts are bitter and angry mm -hmm. and they're just doing it for different reasons and that only God knows the heart and... Um, it's interesting that <clears throat> that he said, pray for me, so he, it sounds like he actually, you know, was repentant, that, you know, at least it sounds like it. It, it, it does. It's, it, it sounds like there's a, there's a chance he, he prayed they, that he repented. Um, it doesn't give us the full story necessarily, um, but it, it, it gives us definitely that there's um, some spiritual and and opposition they ran up against, but also people that that the church ran up against. Also, even here, that, that we're looking at, at trying to do things for their own good. Um, we still see that today um, in different ways, but we see, it shows the power of the Holy Spirit that, that this man was known as a sorcerer, and they were able to um, to show a greater power than, than someone that was known to be called the great power. Um, through the Holy Spirit, it, it shows that um, that they continue to go out in, into the, into the world and, and, and pray for people, and, and that they were they were changing people's lives. And so that was that was good. Go ahead, Jim. I have a, a bit of a tangent, but it's just hitting me wrong. In verse 22. Repent of the wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you. Your translation says perhaps, and my understanding of the definition of perhaps is possibility, mm -hmm. and God will always forgive if we come 
as in forgive me and, and his forgiveness is come. So can you can you touch that a little bit? Why that would be perhaps he left? Am I missing something? I, I think that you know they, they all um, there are there are well specifically the there's there's one sin that's talked about like the, the blasphemous right. of the Holy Spirit that right. you may not likely not be forgiven for. Um, here I think what what he he may say is um, it, it the conditions of praying and asking for forgiveness are truly to have a repentant heart and right. go away from it. So right? he's referring more so to even it, he may be speaking to that person directly as far as if if they are able to um, repent and more than just say the words okay. that God may That's forgive. Them. Heart yes. felt in a yeah. and, and they may have also not felt empowered to speak for God either, right? And that they may have, have said, hey, you know, this is it's God's who can who can forgive. You know, we, we're not going to, to necessarily say that they forgive because as you were also in in the gospels um, you know, Jesus would say, "Your sins are forgiven," and and there was a very also people would say um, at that time, "Who are you? How can you say that someone's sins are forgiven?" Right? And so that it may have also been a, a little bit of not wanting to show themselves as on the same level right. as where as we God. are today. It's a whole different environment. Do you think it might be too <clears throat> that he allowed people to call him the Great One, as opposed to the One True God, and that he was committing some blasphemy? And that he was angry because the apostles took some glory away from him. So he was in himself, I mean, committing blasphemy. I would, I would agree with that as well. Is that yeah, he definitely was putting himself in the spotlight and calling the great the great power. So I, I, I definitely felt he, he he probably felt very threatened by by their ministry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well that helps because it's a good example for people when they ask those questions. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. It started at the beginning of the story of Saul, when he was uh, persecuting the church and the effect it had on spreading the word. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it's drawing attention to, uh, I look at verse 15 and 16, um, it talks about how there were believers there that had accepted the word of God and they had simply been baptized in water, you know, and so it's drawing this distinction mm -hmm. between those that have simply been baptized in water and then this next baptism of the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit and how that needed to happen. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's also interesting they, 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 they specifically sent people there to help them be baptized. Right? That was that important to them that they, they traveled. I agree. Thank you. So overall, I think the whole section is about you need the Holy Spirit to succeed for God, not money. Yes, whatever. You can't do it on your own. Very good. Okay, good. Um, thank you. Very good points. I appreciate it that as well. Um, the hermeneutics, so remember we talked, hermeneutics means what can we take out of this for today? How do we apply this to our life? And, um, and some of the guidelines the authors of the book give that they, they recommend is if it explicitly states this is how we should act, um, then we should consider that. That is something that we should definitely apply. Um, if not, then we need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Some things are, like we talked a little bit uh, um, about the organization of the church, some of that's how they did it. Is it necessarily how every other church should do it? That they had specifically that number of, of people um, and, and what they were doing? Yes and no, you have to look at the situation and decide, right? Um, and consider what, for the situational points. Um, generally, uh, doctrinal, uh, statements that fall into you know, basically three categories as we go through through Acts. So Christian theology, which is what we believe, um, the Trinity, God, 
His love, all of sin, Jesus died and resurrected to redeem us from sin, salvation. Those are all examples of, of theology. Then the next is, is Christian ethics, how we should relate to each other, like the golden rule, how we should, um, how they showed the example of the, the widows of, of certain groups felt like they were not being taken care of, and that was not right, right? That they needed to correct that situation, that everybody should be taken care of equally. And then um, the, the Christian experience, what we do as, as spiritual people. Uh, communion is, is, is identified, but it's not stated, okay, you should do it every week, you should do it every month. It's not um, set as a precedent of, okay, grape juice is okay, or you should use wine. Like that, that's not discussed here, but that's stuff that we can take as, as an organization and decide for ourselves. Um, but the precedent of, of doing communion is, is explicitly is explicitly said there, and then also, like meeting as a church, it's, it doesn't say meet on Saturday, meet on Sunday. You know those things are not there, but we should meet. Um, and then, like we talked a little bit, the, the baptism of, of of water. Um, one of the things that that people when they when they say uh, about baptism of water, I didn't realize this in the past. Um, but learned it through, through going through this, is that in Samaria there wasn't a body of water. So they couldn't necessarily go and do a, a full, it wasn't easy for them to do a full baptism of immersion. So sometimes they believe that this might have been with a sprinkling. But, you know, a lot of people, and what we primarily teach right now is, is the full immersion if you, if you can do it, of course. But it doesn't say that that one way is, is, is necessarily wrong. Um, and then as we continue to look, like how do we, how do we apply the, the precedent to today? Um, is, and is there an incidental lesson that can be learned? Um, let's look at some other examples of, of precedent outside of Acts. So like uh, Matt, Matthew 12, one through eight. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain to eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath, uh, the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay. So what's, what's the precedent here that's set? And it shows it two places, right? It shows, it shows that, um, that David and, and, and Jesus, right? That, that they specifically did something, right? Well, they both ate food from the temple, which was only allowed for the priests to do. Um, and therefore, that would make the priest of that time crazy because of their legalistic views of what was never actually meant to be. Right. And so I think the precedent was was more along the lines of worry about the people more than, exactly. than the rules. Right? And, and, uh, go ahead. I believe in the same way that he does often when he's talking to the Pharisees, Christ is throwing scripture at them because they go based on scripture as well. So he is Melchizedek, showing he is king, he is very very good. Who said that? <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I, I think that's very important because yeah. that's the priestly line and everything that we're talking about and learning about in the book of Acts, even even when you bring this one up, which I thought was incredibly cool that you stuck this in here, is, is that we're looking at a new covenant. 
We are no longer under that ruling, which was an earthly ruling. We are now learning that it's a spiritual world, and we have spiritual sacrifices, we have a spiritual temple, and there's a difference in how we react and act, knowing that we have one foot in, in this world of reality and another foot in that spiritual world. Yeah, absolutely. To, to use wisdom, to use the Holy Spirit to guide us and, and not get so stuck up on, on the prior laws and, and regulations. Amen. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And when, Go ahead. No, I said, when he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, there you go. it sounds really cool and it's really hard to do sometimes. Yes. Absolutely. As in the flesh, it really is. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, let's look at the next one, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up and indulged in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 20,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by this destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of, of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under, under it. Any, um, any precedent set, set here? What jumped out at me is that he said that no temptation has seized you except what common to man and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted. It, commonly people say God will never give us more than we can handle, which is not true because yeah. he helps us to get through anything. But it's funny, it's interesting how people kind of take that and they're like, well then, it, you know, they, they use it as an excuse to do whatever they want to do because it's God's fault, that kind of thing. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it specifically says tempted beyond what you can, you can bear as temptation, which, which he also says is anything that you're tempted by has already been, someone else has already gone through that. This is nothing new as far as temptation. So there's no temptation that is outside of what man has already, already seen. Um, I think that it's, 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 it's a good point. I think that... Um, it also says, you know, what we learn through through Acts is the Holy Spirit can help us do that, and He gives us ways out, um, and He gives us ways to stand to stand firm in, in the face of temptation. Um, I think it also says, okay, these things that happened to them were examples, right? Mm -hmm. and, and necessarily that that having the same type of of um, 
of consequences that happen to him, happen to them, would not necessarily happen to us, right? Even and we could still be in error. And so I think that's that's something to watch out for because it says specifically watch out that you don't fall. Okay. That is a, is again something that that was a story repeating a story um, that was happening further in the Bible. And, and it's, re, it's something that we need to, to watch out for, for today. So, I think we're kind of getting up, out of time. Any other questions or comments someone likes to make before we close? Go ahead. Um, I don't want to take up any. I mean, it's just interesting to me how he recounts Old Testament things that happen with saying, be careful. I don't want you to be ignorant because God is the same God. And people a lot of times are like, that was the Old Testament. He would never do that. He might not do it the same way, but he's still the same God, and he still hates sin. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And the temptations and the tools that the devil use are kind of the same as well. We've got to be on guard for this. Any other comments, questions? Okay, yes, sir. Do you have a section that you're going to teach next week so that I can read I'm through following it, it specifically through, in, the, in the direction that okay, it Okay, because so, sometimes it, like I'm trying to apply yeah. what you're saying, like read the whole thing in a setting, have this, and so if we're going to discuss like, Good point. like another chapter next week, maybe we wouldn't be able to read it all the time. Yeah. You so don't have so much. Next, next week, we're specifically we're going to talk about the gospel. Okay. <laughs> my teachers used to imagine the situation with my home from Kevin and I. Well, we're past that. Don't think it is, because you best. I think she's a teacher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Then thanks. I uh, wish you guys all a great week. I know. I've done a good job. All you do is respond. Sometimes. I try. Um, okay. You'll solve it. I'm thinking right. fifth grade math. <laughs> You know, I, I would do it really the easy way. Well, we haven't covered that kind of thing. Yeah, I never read something in one setting sometimes. It's hard to do. Yeah, and now I'm looking it's at this and I'm like, oh, huh, there was a video. It's, it's suggested that it's not like it's such a long book. Oh, no, 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 no,